Uh, how many of you glad he's a way maker? Say amen. amen. Uh, I'm so thankful for the Jesus that I serve and that, that, that loves me even with all my stuff. Uh, today we're going to be talking, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 3. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. Matthew chapter, excuse me, 2, not chapter 3. Uh, we're going to talk about some unexpected guests. How, how, many of you, how many of you are host people? Like you're the kind of people that are like, please come to my house. How many of you are that person? Me, me, me. Obviously. Okay. In case any of you are wondering, she's right here if you need a place to go hang out. Um, how, how many of you are like, I don't mind if you come, but call me first? How many of you, is that yeah. you? Yeah. It says a lot about the rest of you. The rest of you pretty much said, don't come to my house. Uh, when Jennifer and I first got married and we started ministry for the first time, we lived in Melbourne, Arkansas, where my first pastor it was. And we lived in a parsonage. If you don't know what a parsonage is, it's a house that the church owns, but they allow the pastor and his family to stay there. Well, in this small community, since the church owned the house, well, they felt like it was the church's house. And so we would have people just roll on in. Um, they wouldn't knock. They wouldn't ring the doorbell. They wouldn't even come to the front door. We'd be getting ready for church on Sunday morning, and a, and a deacon would come in the side door, hey, Pastor Vince! And, it was glorious. Um, but, but Jennifer and I learned a system where I would run the distraction. I would see or hear them, and so I'd try to catch them in the kitchen or living room while she done what we affectionately call the stash and dash. Anybody know what I mean by the stash and dash? How many of you know what I mean, but you've never heard the term stash and dash? Okay, so how many of you have ever put something in your oven that doesn't technically belong in your oven? Anybody? I have melted handles off of pans because I put it in the oven and then forgot that I put it in the oven. Uh, anybody ever use their dryer for things other than clothes? Because that door doesn't have a window on some of them, so... You can, so we, we, we went through that. Not everybody likes unexpected guests. Um, in fact, we've proven that more and more and more now with most of us now, we go like this. Who's at the door? <laughs> I have a package for you. Just leave it. Just leave it on the porch. You may be in the kitchen. You're not going to answer the door. <laughs> just leave it on the porch. And you tell your ring doorbell to leave, tell them to leave it on the porch. And so we, we're, we're not good with unexpected guests. This week has been an unexpected week of blessing for Real Life Church. Um, I, I just, as a pastor, I've done this now 22 years, a pastor for 22 years. Churches this size and a lot smaller. And I've been so thankful and blessed. But I will tell you, I don't know that I've ever been more proud of my church than I had this last week. Um, the way you guys showed up for the kids in our gift program, the tag program, was so amazing. And then we had, we had a, a, just a, a mix-up that happened towards the end of the week, and when that happened, we ended up getting quite a few more names that came in of kids that we, we, we had, we just weren't able, we didn't figure, we just missed them. And in the matter of two days, I didn't even post it on the church website or the church page, I just put it on my personal Facebook page, and, and so many of you all jumped in and took care of those kids. Um, and, and what's great is, I, I say this because I believe it's something we should be better at. We had another church in town saw it. Another church in town contacted me and said, hey, we want to sow into what real life is doing for the kingdom. And although we don't have people that can go shop, we have finances. And so they gifted $1,000 to go buy gifts for kids. Um, and, and how many of you are from and around the Bible Belt? How many of you know that churches in the Bible Belt historically don't have a track record of working together? It's ridiculous. I'm just going to tell you my heart on that. Um, and so they sewed into us. Then this morning before the 8.30 service, I had a couple families, two couples came up to me and said, Pastor Vince, we'd like to talk with you for a second. I said, yes, sir. And he said, we have something for the REACH Center. We heard what you guys were doing. And if you don't know what the REACH Center is doing, we've opened up now to, we are, are full time, we are open every night from 6 p.m. to 7 a.m. every night from now until March. 
We opened up Wednesday. We're sleeping anywhere from about eight to 15 people thus far. That number will only grow as people know about it. And so if you're looking for a way to jump in and get involved, help serve, that's one way to do it through the REACH Center this, this winter time. Reason we did is we found out that we were really causing a lot of confusion and we weren't being a lot of help by just being an emergency shelter where we would open for two days and close for three days and then open for four days and then shut down for five days. It created a lot of inconsistency and we weren't able to really walk alongside anybody. We weren't able to just kind of help and get resources and, and do the things we felt the REACH Center was equipped to do. And so not knowing how we were gonna do it because the REACH Center is completely funded on its own by donation. It is a ministry outside the umbrella of Real Life Church. In other words, it's here and we, we started it, we, we founded it, but I, don't think, I didn't think it was fair to go, well, we need to, we need to figure out how to completely fund that because it is a benevolent organization. And so, so it is funded strictly by donations. And those, so that, and so it was kind of like, how are we gonna be open every night? How are we gonna feed people every night? How are we gonna do this every night? And um, man, this morning at 8.30, before the 8.30 service, these two couples come in and go, hey, we're from another church here in town. And we heard what you're doing at the REACH Center. And they gifted us $5,000 for the REACH Center. Amen. They had never walked in the door of the REACH Center. They don't, they don't know what happens there other than what we've told them, other than what you've shared with them. And so between blessing kids, between blessing people that are need, and people go, Vince, why do you do these things? I'm just gonna tell you this is my heart. If you don't know me, if this is your first time at Real Life Church, I hope you hear my heart in this. I believe the gospel is simple. It's simple. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. I believe the gospel is simple. I believe living out the gospel is simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. Hey, how many of you know sometimes the simplest things to do are the hardest things to do? You say, well, how do you flesh it out? How do you live it out? When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was cold, you gave me your coat. When I had a need, you filled the need. In real life church, and from the bottom of your pastor's heart, Thank you for giving me a church that I'm so stinking proud of and walking alongside us in this mission, this mission to not just be a church in this community, but to be a church that changes the community. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, and we have baptisms today, so come on, Jesus, right? Yeah. So it's a good day today. We're going to celebrate. Next week's going to be a lot of fun. I said this at the end of last service. I'll say it to you. In your seats is an invitation. There's a, just a square card there, and it's not complicated. It just has our service times for next weekend. Noon on Saturday, 6 p.m. on Sunday. We're going to give you the morning to just make your living room a chaotic mess or to be with family. Then we want you to come back, and we're going to close out Christmas celebrating the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So come back 6 o'clock Sunday night or noon on Christmas Eve. There'll be the same service, okay? So don't come expecting one. You're just going to hear me twice, all right? <laughs> And so, uh, but bring somebody. That card, I want you to begin praying about it right now. Don't just hand it to somebody. I want you to begin praying over that card right now. God, whose hand does this need to go into? What family needs to walk in the door with me next week at these services? Now, here's what I know about sowing a seed. They may not come next week. They may not come on New Year's Day. Do you notice what we did on New Year's? We got rid of that 830 service on New Year's Day. <laughs> 10 o'clock and 11.30. They may not come on the 1st. They may not come on the 8th. They may not come on the 15th, 22nd. I don't know when they're going to walk through the door. We don't know when they're going to walk through the door, do we, Bob? You guys have seen Bob up here doing announcements and helping out. And Bob is a great friend to me. We've been friends for years. 30 plus years we've been friends. And it took me years of just going, Bob, I'd love to see you at church. Not pressing him, not beating him up, just planting a seed. Bob, hey, come hang out with us at church. I'd love to see you there, man. Love to hang out with you. And years later, that seed that was sown produced fruit. Give that to somebody and don't give up on them. 
All right, Matthew chapter two, if you have your Bible, we're gonna read about the wise men. Love the wise men, probably some of my favorites in the story because they are the most misunderstood and most misrepresented characters in the Christmas story. A, they weren't at the Christmas story. So people get mad at me every year for this, but I just feel it's my theological duty to share this with you. Move your wise men from your nativity. (laughs) Put them in the kitchen (laughs) or your neighbor's house. That would be awesome, right? Just walk up with the three little guys. Excuse me. Could they hang out here for a couple weeks? <laughs> but wouldn't that be a great opener? That would be awesome. Why? Well, they weren't really at the story. Can I tell you? That was free, if any of you needed an opportunity <laughs> right there. But I love these guys because, again, there's just so much assumption that takes place that, that we, we move into that the Bible doesn't necessarily tell us. We always assume... Three wise men. We even wrote a song about it. We three kings of Orient are. That is a depressing Christmas song. (laughs) The Bible doesn't say there was three. It only says there was three gifts. There could have been up to 20, could have been up to 50, depending on the size of the entourage and the importance of the magi or the wise men that came. So it wasn't a small thing when they rolled into town. They got an audience with Herod. Not everybody gets an audience with Herod. So there was a a level of value that these guys had, but again, we dress them up, we put them at the nativity scene, and sometimes we miss what they really brought. What they really brought. So I'm going to read through this, Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? First step bad idea to tell a king there's another king. (laughs) There's a boldness in these wise men. For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. Let me clarify that statement because Jerusalem was waiting for a new king. Jerusalem was anxious for a new king. They, were, they had been praying for a Messiah. They had been praying for a new ruler. They were not fans of the Roman rule, and they were not fans of Herod. So when it says, and Herod was troubled, the reason Jerusalem was troubled because Herod was troubled. He passed that down. How many of you ever heard the phrase, if mama ain't happy? This is the principle that I'm talking about with Herod, okay? If Herod wasn't happy, he was going to make sure no one in Jerusalem was happy. And so King Herod was troubled, and all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. And so, and assembling, he began to get the chief priests and the scribes, the religious leaders of the people, of the Jewish people, and he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Where is he at? They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet. This is Micah chapter 5 in your Old Testament. Micah chapter 5, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people. Two different leadership terms there. We see first he's called a ruler, and then he is called a shepherd to let you know what type of leader Jesus would be. And this was hundreds of years ago that this was written. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and he ascertained from them what time had the star appeared and he sent them to Bethlehem saying go and search diligently for the child and when you have found him bring me word that I too may come and worship him after listening to the king they went on their way and behold the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until they came till it came to rest over the place where the child was where the child was in Matthew chapter 1 we see him referenced as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. It also says that they came into the house where the child was, not the stable where the babe was. See, the Bible is pretty clear. You just have to slow down and read it sometimes. So there was some time that passed here. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Unexpected guest. I need you to understand the reality of the tension of this moment. 
We, we know the Magnificat of Mary where she starts to this prayer of blessed am I among women because of this and Lord be unto you and I'll be your servant. I, yes, Lord. She says yes to Jesus about raising the Messiah. Now typically when a baby is born, everybody's encouraging, right? Boy, somebody has a baby and we'll tell them that's pretty even if it's not. <laughs> am I lying? Now everybody that's had a baby is questioning whether their baby is pretty or not. I think all babies are pretty, just in their own special way. And so we'll, incur, we'll tell them they could be present and, oh, look at those, look at those roles. They're going to be healthy. They're, and we always say the right things. Mary, this night that Jesus was born was chaos. It would have been like Black Friday in Bethlehem. Okay? I mean like old Black Friday when you actually had to go to the store. I'm not talking about new Black Friday where you just shop online. It would have been like that through Bethlehem. That's why there was no room at the end. That's, it was pushing and shoving. It was people in the way. It was her being with child about to burst. We don't know when her water broke. We just know that the Bible says, and it was time. That's typically when we know it's time. This was Chaos finding some place to get shelter so she can have this baby in a filthy stable. And then, eight days later, they go before the priests, Simeon and Anna. To be circumcised, Jesus was a Jewish boy. This would have been tradition, culture. So eight days later, he goes to the temple to be circumcised. And Simeon gives Mary this word, this prophecy. And it's not about how he's going to be king. It's not about how he's going, to, he's going to be a mate. It's not that. He says, Mary, this child will be as a sword into your heart. That's the last thing Mary had in regards to Jesus before she gets a knock on the door from people she doesn't know a group of foreigners that are asking about the king. I don't know that it was a welcome opening. I don't know that it was just, come on in. I think there would have been fear. There would have been fear. By this time, Herod was panicking a little bit. By the time the wise men got there, he asked specific questions on, when did you see the star? We know it was a specific question because with the range he put on his decree, which was to kill every male child under the age of two. If this would have been an immediate moment at Bethlehem, he could have said kill every child under six months. But he said two years. And so these men show up to Mary's door. And what did they show up to? What did they... What did they bring, these unexpected guests? What did they bring? Well, bring, Vince, they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's the easy stuff. We'll get to that in a second. What I want to talk to you about is just the simplicity of what they brought. And sometimes the far-fetchedness of what they brought that we just forget because we know this story so well. Everybody in the house, do this to me. Say, we believe it. We now, I want you to say it like you believe it. Say, we believe it. We believe it. How many of you believe the Christmas story? Like, A.W., great. Um, <laughs> glad you're here. Glad you're here today. Um, let's try this again. How many of you believe the Christmas story? Okay. You believe Jesus is the Son of God? Amen. You believe that he was crucified, rose from the dead, and one day soon is coming back again? Yes. Okay. Why? You don't have to answer it out loud, but you need to know the answer. You need to know the answer. Because here's the thing. The wise men, whatever they brought to the table, I want you to imagine. We know because we have a history of Jesus. We have the 33 and a half year life of Jesus to look at. And we even, even have moments in our life where we experience the things of Jesus. The power of God. The move of the Holy Spirit. We have those things where I can look at. I have never seen him face to face, but I have seen his works in my life every day. We all know that. The wise men didn't. They had a book and a star and left their land and said, that's where we have to go. Why? Because we believe it. We believe it. You believe what? I believe the writings in Jeremiah. I believe the writings in Micah. I believe that there will be a star that leads us. And there it is, because that's new, that's different. We're going. And they left 
On what grounds? They believed it. I wonder how far that gets us. Do you leave home? Do you leave everything? Do you sacrifice it all simply because you believe it? As they did? Are you willing to step into the unknown, the, the journey that it was? I don't know how long a journey it was. Some people said they came from Persia, some Chaldean, some Babylonian. I don't know that it matters where they came. They just didn't get there in a day's time, this journey. The star appeared when he was born, and it took up to two years to get there. On what grounds? They believed it. And the moment we run into conflict, we at times back off. I don't want to offend anybody, but don't you believe it? Well, yeah, but do you believe it like that? They said, well, we saw his star. This is, we, we, where is he who has been born the king of Jews? Not, was there someone born who is the king of Jews? Where is he? Well, how do you, we know he was born. Why? We believe it. Where is he? This one who was born, the king of Jews. For we saw his star when it rose. And that was enough? Think about the, how ludicrous this is. Somebody rolls up to your house, knocks on the door. It's like, hey, I traveled two years to get here. Why? Because I read something in a book and I believe it's here. Can I come in? How many of you are calling somebody in that moment when an entourage is at your house telling you that they saw a star and came to your house and you need to let them in so they can check out your baby. <laughs> Think about it. Again, we read these stories so much that we sometimes pull the reality out of it and we, we recognize it as Charlie Brown's Christmas or something along those lines, but we forget. There was a reality. There was a mom and a dad going, he told us there would, this would be a piercing through our heart. Is this, is this it? We, we weren't promised the time. We were just promised he would change everything. And is this it? They believed it, and they followed. That was it. I don't know how that went we're in their land where they said, hey, we're getting a group together. Why? To follow a star. To do what? To go find a baby. And do what? Worship him. Where? Over there. See the star? It's that area. I don't know if you guys have seen stars before, but it's not easy to figure out where under a star they are. That's, wh that's what they left on. That was the faith they had. We, and we wrestle with it. Somebody, will, you'll see something online and go, hmm, I wonder if that's right. No, it's most likely not. Well, it could be, and we'll, we'll start sprinkling doubt in our own belief rather than just trusting that God is exactly who he says he is and he does exactly what he says he will do and he does it over and over and over and over again. How many of you have been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ? Hands up. Think about this. Leave your hands up. Leave your hands up. Look. He did it there, 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 and all across the room, and we struggle believing he can do it in our lost friend at work. Do you believe it? The wise men brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Most of us don't know what happened. Two-thirds of those things are. We all know what gold is. <laughs> the other ones were like, mm, I don't know. We know they brought them. It's in those weird boxes in our little ceramic statues. What they brought to us, what we should have seen in the wise men, was the faith to step into this and go, that's him, and that's all I need. That's him, and that's all I need. Do you believe it like they believed it? Micah said it. Matthew chapter 2, verse 9 says that the star which they saw in the east went before them till it stood over the young. This star, we don't know. That's, that's just what it said, so we're going to trust it and believe it. Written from a book, not from their land, and they trust it. They believed. And we continually put these fleeces out to God. If you'll do this, then I'll do this. Lord, if you'll help me in this, then I'll. Growing up, I always heard it was called uh, jailhouse salvation. 
That's not to be offensive to anybody because I believe Jesus saves everywhere. Paul converted an entire prison to, to the point where the whole place shook under the power of God. So I, I don't have a problem with it. But the idea is, well, sometimes you get so desperate where your only option is to make a deal. Lord, if you'll do this, then I'll do that. That is not how this works. It's not how it works. We see that in the wise men's process. So first thing is they believed it. Second thing we see is you've got to know why you're coming. Why, why, why are you seeking this king? Why are you here today? Why were they seeking the king? It wasn't, surely it couldn't just be to bring some gifts. Like, I mean, I understand the gifts. You show up to a king, you better bring something. But that couldn't have been why, or couldn't have been all of it. And we see their why in the same verse. Where is he who has been born the king of Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. That was the end of it. We came to worship him. That's why. That's what they told Herod. Hey, we know your role, but we also know what we know, and he, we believe it, and we're going to worship him. Do you know what a smack in the face that was to Herod? To hear people in your throne room tell you that they're going to worship someone else? But they did. And they went, and they went to worship. I think oftentimes we as believers, and I don't know if you guys maybe help me out on this, sometimes we as believers, we really enjoy our relationship with God because of the benefits. Listen, please don't hear this as judgment because I'm really stoked about heaven. And that's a benefit. It's a promise. But I think sometimes we really seek after God and we seek after God because of the, the blessing on the other side of it. And what I love is that their purpose was worship first. Worship. Why are you coming? Well, so he'll bless us on our way home. No, worship. That's why we're coming. Because he's the king and he deserves to be worshipped. That's why we're here. No, you mean you didn't come to get out of this or you didn't come so that God would help you in your marriage or you didn't, God didn't come to help you with your kids? You didn't come so God would... No, we came because he is God and he is worthy. And the bonus will be that he helps us in these things. The bonus will be these things. The blessing will be this, but the reality of my reason is that there's a country singer right now and... I don't know how this happens, but his name is Jelly Roll. <laughs> and he's only got, had a couple songs that have hit radio and got any kind of playtime, but he's got a new one that just came out, and the song is called Need a Favor. And the opening line of the song is, I only talk to God when I need a favor. I only pray when it seems I don't have a prayer. Well, who am I, who am I to expect a Savior when I only talk to God when I need a favor? And I nearly ran off the road. I'm like, that'll preach! I'm like, voice memo. <laughs> I'm spitting into my phone, and it's, it literally sounds like I'm speaking in tongues, so I tried to listen back to it. I'm like, I don't know what to say. I don't even know what I'm saying. But I was, I, I was like, man, the simplicity of that and the reality of what I would call Christian culture Lord, I need your help. Lord, I need your help. Let me just clarify this right out of the gate for you. What you need from God is a savior. First, first, that's what you need. First, you need a savior. The wise men show us this. They got a boatload of gifts on their camels or mules or donkeys or horses or what. We don't even know what they rode. So if you got a camel, maybe. But they had gifts. They walked in the door. And fell down and worshipped him. Before they ever gave him the gifts, they gave him themselves. This is not easy. I struggle with this one. I know I have some gifts. Claire, there's some things I do pretty well. And I've been doing them well since I was that big. First time I was given a Sunday school class was at a Bible study. I was seven. My mom said, take the other kids upstairs and do something with them. <laughs> Turn with me in your children's Bible to Genesis chapter one. <laughs> seven years old, I took an offering. I've been doing it since I was, I started working funerals and weddings with my dad when I was 12. 
had my little black suit at 12 years old standing at the processional at the funeral. I didn't know what to say, so I just nodded. <laughs> Started teaching Sunday school, like I said, that early, but as far as actually teaching Sunday school, I was about 14 when I started teaching the seven and eight-year-old class. And I was the guy that just stepped in wherever there wasn't a teacher. Started preaching when I was in my early 20s. Started pastoring when I was in my early 20s. I don't know anything. I've always done this. And so there are times that I come to God and go, man, I wonder what I can bring to the table for God. I know he needs me. I know he uses me. Not needs me. That, that would be really arrogant. I don't know that I ever... I'm not going to lie to you. There are times that I have thought that God needed me. Can I just be honest with you? I go, Lord, I, this is what I can bring you. This is what I can bring you. Some of you struggle with it right now because you're sitting there and the fight that you have in your spirit when you do feel conviction is you feel like you don't have anything you can bring. Lord, I've got this past behind me. I've got this junk behind me. I've got this garbage life behind me. I've got these poor decisions behind me. I don't have anything that I can bring. Lord, you can't use me for anything. And what he is wanting is you to walk in the room Here I am. God, I have nothing but me. Here's the, here's the amazing thing. When you give him you, the things you have become valuable. Not until after he has you, though. That's the process, and the wise men show us that. See, they brought their best, but it had nothing to do with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That just became useful after they knelt and worshiped God. After these unexpected guests in a little house in Bethlehem who knew nobody knew anybody. Why are you here to worship him? Why? Because he's the king. And that's enough. We can't, he's only two. He can't do anything for you. He showed up. That's enough. He can't even bless you. He can't even speak a promise of it. He doesn't have it. He's the king. That's enough. I don't know that the wise men didn't have the purest form of worship of Jesus because there was nothing that infant, that nothing that toddler could do for them in the moment other than stand there or sit or crawl. I don't know. But he didn't have to, he was, the, he was enough. I wonder, is Jesus enough in your life? Or are you still trying to figure out what you have to bring him to make it enough? Because what I'll tell you is, he really just wants you. He really just wants you. He, your stuff, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He don't need our stuff. That becomes a tool in the box once we give him us. This Christmas season, you've spent all already this season. It's a week away. Christmas is in seven days. I know, some of you just threw up in your mouth a little bit. <laughs> some of you already, this is the heartbreaking part, some of you already are like, and I can't wait till it's over. He came. He showed, he showed up. Not somebody, not a substitute. The king of kings showed up. And we ought to celebrate. We ought to bow down. We ought to kneel before him. Not because of the gifts he brings or the transaction that we believe in of what we bring, but the fact that he is the son of God and you were enough for him to show up for. So why can't he be enough for us to show up for? Do you believe it? Oh, you raised your hands. You said amen. Do you believe it like they did? Yes. I don't need a lot, Jesus. I need you. That's all I need. Do you know why? Because he is who he is. That's why. Not because he blesses me. Not because if somebody used to say this all the time, if there was no heaven, would you still follow Jesus? He's still the best alternative. He is still the best option. And he is still God. 
He is enough. He is enough.